Yes, thank you. So hi, everyone. And um, I'd like to thank the organizers for this uh, wonderful uh, series and for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, today, I will be talking about control of uh, uh, tissue flows and actually uncovering also modularities of tissue flows in avian gastrulation. This work was led by Alex Plum, is a PhD student in my group, uh, Guillermo, a postdoc, Guillermo Serrano, a postdoc uh, in the Steventon Lab at Cambridge and the uh, Kisberg Group at the uh, University of Dundee. Um, so it's very well known. Uh, sorry if some videos will not play. Uh, the, my PowerPoint just updated now, five minutes ago. It's an unpleasant surprise. But uh, it's very clear and well known that in early development, cells will undergo large scale motion at the, actually the embryo scale and uh, uh, across model systems. And uh, today we'll be focusing on the chick or avian gastrulation, which is the example on the right. And uh, in the cheek gastrulation, at the very early stage of development, the embryo is just a thin disc, is uh, three millimeter wide. There are about uh, 50,000 cells. And this uh, disc sits on top of the yolk that you can actually visually see uh, cracking an egg. And in the first 15 hours of development, the embryo transforms from a circle into a pear-shaped structure. And if you image this uh, disc of 50,000 cells, you can see a very um, vigorous uh, multicellular flows. And today I want to sort of touch base on two uh, concepts. The first one is trying to understand how the embryo controls its geometry. How does it transform from a circle into a pear-shaped structure in this first 15 hours of development? And the second question I want to try to address is whether these spatiotemporal complex flows, which are typical of basically any morphogenetic process, not uh, to the specific to the chick embryo, can we actually decompose them in kinematic units that perhaps have different developmental biology functionality? Uh, they can they have different origin or mechanistic origin and perhaps can be controlled uh, independently. Just to give you uh, a perspective of uh, avian morphogenesis, we'll be looking only at the first 15 hours of development, while the full evolution of uh, this developmental process takes uh, about uh, 20 days. So when you put this embryo under a confocal microscope, you can basically see uh, or extract uh, velocity fields using a PAV. Um, and uh, to study these multicellular flows, you can either use Eulerian approaches, which is, for instance, looking at velocities at fixed Eulerian coordinates. And then you get something like this, so which are basically streamlines or you know velocity snapshots at different times. Uh, however, this Eulerian approach has some bottlenecks that are or problems that have been recognized, for instance, in continuum mechanics. And the first, most important one is being uh, frame dependent. That means, for instance, that uh, if I now change the coordinate system I want to use to describe its, this motion, the motion of cell, and the origin of this coordinate system is pretty arbitrary. Or, for instance, if you have an embryo that slightly drifts under your microscope, the structures of these velocities will completely change. Okay, so an alternative to this Eulerian approach is instead looking at Lagrangian approaches, which is instead of looking at the embryo from a fixed grid, you instead look at the motion and the formation of the embryo. So basically you look at cell tracks or tracks or trajectories of patches of tissue. So you start at the particular initial condition X0, you observe the system for a certain time interval, depending on your experiment, this blob has been now moved to a different position. And on top of trajectories, you can also compute the deformation gradient, which is just the uh, Jacobian of this flow map or trajectory map, if you will. And that basically is going to tell you how, for instance, an initial disk of cells will transform into an ellipsoid and it's going to tell you what's, what are the directions, maximum stretching, etc. And uh, this, if you want to visualize it, it's very also very simple. You can just overlay a Lagrangian grid that deforms with uh, your, um, your embryo, and that gives you a view of how the tissue deforms as uh, it uh, um, evolves over time. Now, the deformation gradient is a tensor, which means that for any initial condition of your embryo domain and for any time interval you're exploring, this is going to be a matrix. So it's very hard to visualize. A very relevant information that you can extract from this tensor is its largest singular value. So you have a tensor for any point of your domain and any time interval, you extract the scalar field, which is the largest singular value, and that tells you the following information. Assume, for instance, you are here. This is your initial or initial embryo location that you want to probe. This largest singular value will tell you 
how much initially nearby cells will maximally separate. So you are initially closed at different sides of this uh, basically line, which is an I value of this larger singular value. And basically tells you that if you have a lot, if you have a very large, larger singular value in this spatial domain, that means that cells that will eventually start close at the opposite side of these lines will separate maximally. So you can imagine that regions where this lambda two is very high will demarcate repellers in the embryo. Those are regions where cells start initially close at the opposite sides of this region, and then it will maximally separate over time. So now you can uh, calculate this um, quantity in the data that I just showed. You can basically iterate over increasing time interval to see how these structures evolve dynamically. And uh, the chick relation data will um, basically be composed of two repellers. There's going to be a repeller number one and a repeller number two over these 15 hours of development. And I'm going to explain the meaning of these two repellers in a second. So the second thing you can do similarly, instead of looking at uh, uh, repulsion, you can also look at convergence, which is looking at another singular value of this deformation gradient. You can see what are the regions that will most strongly attract cells that will initially start far away from each other. And that's basically going to be another structure, another regions where a scalar field will be high, which is this, this structure here. So this is going to be an attractor, which in this chick gastrulation case corresponds to basically the primitive streak. This is a region where cell will converge in this disk, and then it will eventually ingress into the third dimension to start the formation of the other germ layers. So basically what we did, we transformed a set of spatiotemporal velocities that are frame dependent into three structures. One repeller, repeller number one, that basically splits all the extra embryonic cells from the embryonic cells. Whatever is within the repeller number one or inside the repeller number one is what's going to form the embryo. The rest are sort of auxiliary cells that are made of extra embryonic uh, cells. Then you have a one attractor, which is basically the primitive streak. This is where cell will converge and then ingress, leaving this epithelium. And then there is repeller number two that basically splits the anterior part from the posterior part of the primitive streak or the attractor. So basically what we did, we compressed these spatial temporal velocities in three kinematic units, two repellers and one attractor. And what we did conceptually, we got rid of all the frame dependent information and we retain also the objective deformation. If you think of deformation, you can also think of the rate of strain tensor, which is accounting for instantaneous deformation or deformation rates, if you will. However, when you have a morphogenetic process, you want to understand how the tissue deforms cumulatively as it moves. Okay, that's basically Lagrangian. That's the difference between the, the rate of strain and this dynamic morphoskeleton. And then, as we said before, the deformation gradient has a lot of information because it has a tensor for any point in your domain. So what we did, we just extract the highest deformation in terms of contraction and uh, or, or repulsion. That's basically what we did. So we, we transform the spatial temporal flows in this three kinematic units. Beyond describing uh, gastrulation, we apply this technique now to several model systems from Drosophila to zebrafish. And recently, we found also that uh, uh, later stages in chick development and also in Drosophila, we found that the emergence of repellers may be important or may be implicated in early sulfate bifurcation, just uh, as a uh, mm, uh, flashing this information. But what I want to talk about today is instead uh, trying to uh, address a few new questions with this technique. So as I said, chic gastrulation can be compressed into two repellers and one attractor. And what we want to understand now is what are the mechanistic origins of uh, uh, these repellers that uh, we, we found? Uh, can we modulate independently this repeller? Are they modular? Are they independent? Uh, how does actually the embryo change its shape from its circular initial geometry to a pear-shaped geometry at later stages? And can we control these repellers independently? To do that, we need to uh, understand a little bit of uh, uh, the cell behaviors and then the mechanistic origins of these cell behaviors or the drivers of these cell behaviors. And uh, as we've seen in the earlier slides, we know that at the beginning of development, the embryo is a disk. There is going to be three regions in this embryo, the extra embryonic territory. Then there is going to be the embryo proper, which is what's going to be inside the embryo. And we know that there is going to be a repeller that splits these two. And then within the embryo proper, there are different cell types in the posterior, which are called mesoderm. 
Now, if you look at this 15 hours later, this embryo has expanded because the edge cells are basically pulling uh, the uh, extra embryonic tissue and also all the embryo. Then the embryo proper is transformed into a pear shape and uh, the mesoderm has now converged to the midline, which is the primitive strict, the attractor, and then it's gonna be ingressing the third dimension. And if you want to look this in a microscope, you can see that this motion is driven by active intercalation in the mesoderm. You can have uh, uh, apical constriction throughout the embryo proper and uh, active cell ingression in the streak. So in the streak, there's gonna be cells that converge to the streak, the active intercalation, then they undergo EMT and they will basically pull the nearby tissue. So they will apply a very strong active force in this developmental process. And the last term is, or the last process, sorry, is about uh, epiboli. So these uh, edge cells, uh, they basically, um, with myosin, they will basically adhere to the vitreous membrane. They will exert traction forces and will basically pull all this uh, um, extra embryonic territory, which is attached also to the embryonic territory. So those are basically the cell behaviors. And all these processes are basically driven by myosin motor. And uh, this is an experimental image in which you can see in red actin and in cyan um, phosphorated myosin too, uh, I, I, I guess. And you can see that the embryo has different regions. Some are active and some are passive. For instance, if you look at edge cells, you see that edge cells are very enriched of myosin because they did not myosin to uh, undergo a Peabody. There is instead the extra embryonic region that has very little myosin, it's basically devoid of myosin, so, so it's more, more of a passive uh, tissue, this uh, epithelium. Uh, there is then the embryo proper that has myosin, but not as much as the primitive streak or the mesoderm regions where there is even more myosin. And on top of myosin intensity, you can also quantify basically myosin anisotropy or if you will, actomyosin cables. So you can basically do fast Fourier transform on these images and you can, you can basically measure if you have actomyosin cables that are oriented. So there's gonna be an orientation in this segment here. And there's gonna be also a length of the segments that tells you how much nearby cells have the same orientation in the axomyosin cables. So those are basically what people call multicellular uh, cables. Okay, so basically with these ingredients, with this quantification, we have everything we, we need to quantify or model the active stresses. Specifically, we have the myosin activity, scalar field, then we have a pneumatic tensor that accounts for the presence of cables. So S is going to be the cable alignment or the pneumatic order parameter. If you don't have cable, S is equal to zero. If you have very aligned cable, S is close to one. Uh, and the phi is just the cable orientation. So with this uh, information, you can now build an active stress. So there's going to be M that tells you the amount of uh, active stress. Uh, I mean, the, the amount of active myosin, and then alpha just converts myosin to stress. And then you have an, iso an identity tensor that accounts for the isotropic active stress that is reflecting basically apical constriction and active ingression. And instead, Q, the pneumatic tensor, accounts for the active intercalation. Okay, so this is just the active uh, stress, and uh, this system is extremely viscous. It's fluid like a long time scales because you, you have basically motion that are uh, very large scale, and there's a lot of you know neighbor exchange. Therefore, we can uh, sort of say that simply that the divergence of the active stress plus the divergence of the passive stress or the viscous stress is equal to zero. That's basically the force balance. And the viscous stress, they have basically the shear force, but also a force due to compressibility. Because this tissue is compressible, it ex expands in area, but also has to accommodate ingression. So from this first equation, very simply, you can read that if you know the distribution of M and Q, you can identify immediately the velocity of the tissue at any time instance. So to close the system, then you need an equation for M and an equation for Q. So the equation for M is about the myosin dynamic is also um, simple. So if you have a cell with a lot of phosphorated myosin and you move, you're gonna carry the myosin with you. That's the advection. Myosin or my activated myosin can be activated by from an available pool of myosin. That's basically the activation term. And myosin can also, uh, or the activated myosin can also detach from actin in a tension dependent manner. This is the detachment uh, contribution, is mechanosensitive. The details of this are basically well explained in the, in the reference. Uh, 
And then the last term is about the myosin induction via tension propagation, which basically reflects the expectation that if I have a myosin cable, an actomyosin cable, and I pull, I will put my nearby junction under tension. And if I put them under tension, due to mechanical sensitivity, they will recruit more myosin. And that's basically what you get, uh, what, what basically is being described by this directed Laplacian. And the, the derivation of this expression is, again, uh, detailed in the, um, in the paper. So a very interesting property of this equation is about uh, the fact that this minus equation has, an, has uh, um, instabilities. This is what we found in an earlier work, and uh, we also validated it experimentally. And specifically, this PD has a stable fixed point of I myosin, which is basically what likely happens in the embryo proper or in the primitive streak, where we have a lot of where you have a lot of myosin. There is also another fixed point in, um, in the lower regime of myosin, so basically very little myosin, which is likely what happened in the extra embryonic region when there is no myosin. Um, and both these two are stable, while there is an intermediate fixed point which is unstable, which is what we believe is where actually the embryo is operating throughout gastrulation, because experiments show that actually there is a strong increase in myosin from from HH1 to HH3. Okay, so the last ingredient that we need is the evolution equation for Q. This is very similar to the active matter equation. So you have the advection term, because if you have cable and order, you're gonna transport them with advection. Uh, you're gonna have that cables are rotated by vorticity. So that's uh, basically encoded in the spin tensor omega here. Uh, but there is also a shear contribution because, you know, shear rates or shear rotation can either construct or destroy order. This is also something known in, in active matter. That's this term here. However, if you just use these uh, three terms, this, this, these equations are not, is not sufficient to recapitulate observation because uh, convergent extension and specifically the shear contribution self destroys order. And therefore, you need a mechanism to sustain order to sustain basically convergent extension. And that's what uh, is uh, uh, um, described in this term, which is the active alignment. This active alignment basically reflects this expectation that if you have a little bit of pneumatic order, so S is greater than zero, naming I have cables, and you have myosin in that regions, these cables will contract, right? So this cable will contract and therefore will create long range order. So will increase basically the S at that particular location. That's basically what we call active alignment. And this was also found recently in uh, from the Schreiman group uh, in uh, uh, vertex model. So they basically found that to have sustained convergent extension, you, you need a mechanism to basically generate order, which otherwise would be destroyed by, for instance, um, uh, shear um, destruction of basically alignment. And the last term is something which is basically happening everywhere in the epithelium because there are a lot of random intercalation and ingression, these processes that will all in general destroy order. So that's basically the passive uh, um, relaxation term. Okay, so now we have this set of equations. Uh, what do we need to um, uh, solve the problem? We need basically boundary conditions. So uh, boundary condition for the force balance is very simple. You just need a Peebole velocity uh, uh, on the, and, um, due to um, the Peebole velocity is just a Dirichlet boundary condition, normal velocity at the boundary of our domain. We can get these numbers from experiments because we can measure the Peebole velocity. And then we use no flux for M and Q. And the last ingredient we need are the initial condition for M and Q. And we know basically two important ingredients. The first one also, as we've seen before, that uh, is that the embryo has more myosin than the extra embryonic region. So in the embryo, there is more myosin. We've seen also in the actin and uh, myosin two uh, plots before. And the second thing is that the cables are actually at the onset of gastrulations are more concentrated in the posterior where the mesoderm is in this basically posterior region of the embryo. And in this posterior region at the beginning, because these cells are mesoderms, they also have more myosin. So basically the boundary condition, the initial condition for the, for the flow is the following for the model is the following. So we have low myosin in the extra embryonic region, higher myosin in the uh, embryo proper, and a little higher myosin in the posterior. And then you have more cable aligned in the posterior. This is basically what we can get from experiments. And the rest is just boundary condition from a Peabody. And I want to basically emphasize something very important, which is that the boundary, the initial boundary between embryonic and extra embryonic region is just a circle at the beginning. 
And now what we are going to do, we're going to evolve this PDE with this initial condition and boundary condition, and we will see how this boundary will sort of self-organize and evolve. But I want to make sure that we understand that we are not imposing anything on this boundary. The boundary of the PDE is just here. So we are, the way this white curve, which is the embryonic boundary, will evolve is just a result, a self-organized result of the model. We're not imposing anything on its evolution. So the question now is, I have the model, we have uh, the, um, the initial condition and boundary conditions. Can the model reproduce what happens in the next 15 hours of development? Matt, and, uh, you have about five minutes, just to let you know. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah. Um, OK, so basically, that's that's basically the model. Uh, you can um, evolve this basically uh, model. You can see the velocity field, the divergence, the evolution of the boundary of the embryo that is basically changing from a circle to a pear shape. This matches experiments in terms of distribution of velocity and divergence. You can also measure the uh, or um, describe the evolution of active uh, isotropic stress. So this shows basically that the myosin increases in the embryonic region, increases even more in the um, in the mesoderm, and if you basically match it with the experimental observation, it's pretty much uh, um, a similar uh, evolution. You can also um, show the distribution of the active anisotropic stress. This is basically m times q, which is the pneumatic order parameters times the orientation, and this also matches observation, which is basically having eventually cables that are perpendicular to the streak where there is a lot of order perpendicular to the streak. And this is basically what you can get if you have the same quantification uh, in experiments. What I want to do now, I want to go to the um, dynamic morphoskeleton and have a Lagrangian assessment of these results, which is uh, I can uh, vector the Lagrangian grid with the model velocity. This is what you get in terms of uh, a deformed Lagrangian grid. You can do the same using a velocity from experiments. You get basically that the embryo transforms from a circle into a pear shape. And you can also recapitulate the repellers. So you can have repeller number one that splits embryonic and extra embryonic, and repeller number two that splits the anterior part and the posterior part. And similarly, you can get the same using the experimental velocity. What we want to do now, we want to understand if these repellers have different mechanistic origins. So what we want to do, we want to try to knock them out separately in the model and experiments. So the first one is eliminating repeller number two. Uh, we, we hypothesize that repeller number two arises from the mesoderm, uh, the uh, active intercalation from the mesoderm. So in the model, we just removed the bump of myosin in the posterior. And we, left, we let the model evolve with exactly the same initial and boundary condition. And this model predicts that the embryo doesn't change shape. If you remove mesoderm, you eliminate repeller two, but retain repeller one. And if you do now the same uh, knockout experimentally, any beating mesoderm induction, you get exactly the same result, which is basically the embryo does not change shape, remains circular, retains repeller number one, but eliminates repeller number two. Okay, so then the second thing, what we wanted to eliminate repeller number one. And to do that, we hypothesize that repeller number one arises from a tug of war between extra embryonic epiboli and apical constriction. So we said, let's block epiboli, which in the model means uh, setting the velocity, the boundary velocity equal to zero. If you solve the model, basically leaving everything else unaltered, you see that the embryo still changes shape. You retain repeller number two, but uh, um, um, eliminate completely repeller number one. So now uh, Guillermo, what he did, he basically, to implement this, he basically burned the vitelline membrane. So he cauterized the vitelline membrane. These cells cannot really exert any more traction because there is no vitelline membrane. And therefore, you can block a people compared to the, the wild type. So when you do that, that uh, experimentally, you still see, indeed, as in the model, that uh, the, mm, the, the embryo still changes shape. You retain the repeller number two, but eliminate completely repeller number one, basically in vivo. And of course, you can now do the combined perturbation, blocking both epiboli and uh, mesoderm. And you see basically that you can block and eliminate repair number two and repair number one together in the model and in the experiments. So basically, what we learned is that repair number one arises as a tug of war between extra embryonic epiboli and apical constriction, while repair number two arises from the active intercalation of the, uh, of the mesoderm. And what was interesting to understand and to see is that you can actually modulate and control these two kinematic modules independently in vivo, consistent with the, with the experiment. So basically, in summary, 
In this uh, short talk, we talked about the control and modulation of repellers. In previous works, we were also able to modulate the geometry of the attractor, which is the primitive streak. We transformed it from a, from a line to a circle, to a point, and to a thicker line, mimicking or re recapitulating um, gastrulation modalities that are typical of other vertebrates uh, in the cheek. So in terms of mini summary of, of, of this story is that uh, we started with experiments with spatial temporal velocity. We compressed those into their kinematic units, the dynamic morphoskeleton. Uh, and then we were able to build a minimal model, minimal active matter model can, that can reproduce these kinematic units. And then using these models and this compression, we were able to devise a model inspired perturbation that were able to knock out these kinematic units independently. So that's basically my summary slide. And perhaps the interesting part that, that I didn't say uh, so far is that basically repeller number one controls the embryo size and area homeostasis via this tug of war between uh, extra embryonic epiboly and epical constriction, while repeller number two controls the embryo shape because we've seen that eliminating repeller number two, the um, cheek embryo remains a uh, circle and doesn't basically change shape. And perhaps the speculation could be that because these are due to different mechanistic origins that can actually be controlled and modulated in vivo uh, uh, distinctly, maybe this modularity could be helpful for evolvability of different aspects of uh, cheek gastrulation. Thank you very much. And perhaps uh, I'll advertise uh, postdoc and, 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 and PhD student positions that we have in the group.